Hi, this is Pastor Darrell Maya from Keller, Texas. Today is Wednesday, September 4th, 2019. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A lot of things going on these days out of, it, uh, out of times of Israel. Netanyahu says Trump peace plan will be released immediately after elections. The election September 17th. What's that? Two weeks. Two weeks from today will be the day after the election. Maybe that's as long as we have to wait to see what this deal of the century is going to look like. Stay tuned. <laughs> Waiting to see more. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Palestinian Authority prepares action plan to extend authority to Area C. People, this Area C is under Israeli control. Uh, it's under Israeli military and civilian control. Palestinian Authority plans to promote and authorize Palestinian building in this area. You think that might be a problem? Now, this, of course, is all um, given approval by the Oslo Accords, which Palestinians are saying, you know what? We're going to completely ignore all aspects of the Oslo Accords. You might want to watch what you're doing there. Just saying. Think it might be a problem? Yeah, it will be. It'll definitely be a problem. Um, Israel is in control of that area. I see them probably annexing Judea and Samaria under Donald Trump's presidency. I think it's coming. Um, out of the Bessa Center, uh, which is the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, Headline says, EU funding of illegal Palestinian settlement in Area C. Area C makes up about 60% of the biblical lands of Judea and Samaria. Um, illegal Palestinian settlements are sprouting up across that region. Palestinians have scrapped the remains of the Oslo Accords. Hmm. Curious to see what results from that. Um... Here's a headline out of the Jewish Journal. I'm just going to read the headline. It's a pretty lengthy read. I've read it. Very interesting. Headline says, Israel has become a five-front war. Five-front war. Now, Psalm 83, it mentions several groups and peoples. And they say, come, let us make sure the name of Israel is remembered no more. And if you do a little research, every one of these groups today is in fact Muslim by nature. Keep in mind that God calls them enemies also. His enemies make a tumult. Israel's become a five-front war. Her enemies seeking her destruction from all sides. This is biblical. It's prophetic. God told us this so long ago. How about this? Out of Israel National News, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says, Arab states condemning Hezbollah sounds like messianic times. It says several times he's mentioned that we're living in a messianic era, that they're expecting the Messiah soon. Huh. <laughs> you you can't make this stuff up. Out of the Times of Israel, IDF publishes photos purporting to expose Hezbollah precision missile factory. Army, Army claims compound built by Lebanese terror group with help from Iran is designed to manufacture motors and warheads of missiles with an accuracy of less than 10 meters. Have you noticed how much Iran has been spreading terror lately and funding it? Where did they get all this money? Oh yeah, Barack Hussein Obama approved them to get $150 billion as he sent them multiple pallets full of cash. And they're using this money to try to defeat Israel, to try to destroy America. I'm curious to see how long it's going to be before this traitor is put in jail for his treasonous acts. Yes, Barack Hussein Obama was a traitor and committed treason 
on multiple occasions. And why the world doesn't see this for what it is, is beyond me. It's amazing. It seems like we live by two standards, one for citizens and another one for those in positions of authority. It's like they're allowed to get away with murder. Case in point, Bill and Hillary Clinton. Follow the trail of blood behind those two. Many people know about it, yet no one's doing anything about it. It's just amazing to me how... If I lived a life like Hillary or Barack, I'd be in jail. Yet, they're buying mansions and spending millions on whatever they want. Justice will be served in this life or the next. Either way. Out of Fox News, Iran building new classified military base in Syria. Hmm. You know, Iran keeps trying to establish military strongholds closer and closer to Israel. You think Israel's going to allow this? They won't. They're building a giant military base in Syria. You think Israel won't probably bomb it before too long? There's coming a moment. There's coming a time. There is coming an event that will cause Iran to fulfill Ezekiel 38, just like the Bible says. Persia leading this world army against Israel. Persia is modern-day Iran. I believe at some point, Israel, in trying to protect themselves, will do a preemptive strike on one of these military bases that Iran is building simply to try to destroy Israel. And Iran's going to respond just like Ezekiel 38 tells us they will. It's coming. It's in God's word, so it will come to pass. Out of NBC News, Chicago mayor tells Ted Cruz, keep our name out of your mouth about gun control. <laughs> oh boy. Chicago mayor rips Senator T Ted Cruz and coward Republicans after Ted cited the city as an example for why gun control doesn't work. Gun control doesn't work, Ted Cruz tweeted. He said, look at Chicago. Disarming law-abiding citizens is not the answer. Chicago has the strongest gun laws in the country, yet 48 shootings over Labor Day weekend with nine deaths or somewhere in that area. Seems Democrats just ignore that. They want to go after these mass shootings. Chicago has the toughest gun laws, yet people are getting shot. Ted Cruz says, go after the, go after the criminals. He said, don't go after law-abiding citizens. Sign of the times, people. How about this headline out of the Atlantic? Coming soon to a battlefield, robots that can kill. Terminator, coming soon to a city near you. Hmm. <laughs> Let's get into the word. Oh, man, the news of the world can be a little depressing if you don't see it from God's point of view, if you don't see it from a biblical perspective. It can be a little overwhelming. Let me ask you a question. Do you think God needs us? Do you think he needs us? In Romans 10, start, actually, you know, I can't read Romans 10, 14 without reading Romans 10, 13. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen and hallelujah. Romans 10, 14. How then? shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, I've heard people say that, oh, God needs us. You know, I've heard people say that the reason God created us was because he was lonely up there in heaven. He needed some companionship, needed some people around. 
I, I don't follow that line of thinking. God doesn't need anyone or anything. But it is true that God loves us. It is true that he longs to have a relationship with us, a friendship with us. But I don't think he needs us. I mean, let me ask you this. Can God reach lost people without us? Of course he can. But does he want to reach lost people without us? I don't think he does. The Bible says right here, how can... How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how are they going to hear without a preacher? God's put each and every one of us where we are for a reason. You might think it's because of your choices, whether good or bad, that you're where you are. We're where we are for a reason. We need to find that reason. We need to ask God for guidance and wisdom and discernment so that we can follow after his will for our lives and not chasing after our own vain glory. And then we can bring honor and glory to the kingdom of God. Maybe you are where you are because God put you there. Maybe that, that cranky neighbor or that foul-mouthed co-worker or that person you come in contact with on a regular basis is your very mission field. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever stop and think about praying for that person by name and praying for an opportunity to be able to engage them in a conversation, to lead them out of the darkness and into the light that is Jesus Christ? You know, there's two things we can do with our lives. We can chase after the empty promises of this world and waste our lives. A lot of people do that. They waste their entire lives chasing the almighty dollar. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying quit your job and, and serve the Lord by preaching every day and hope he blesses you with financial abilities. Um, I work multiple jobs to keep the bills paid. But I'm always serving, no matter where I am. I prayed with a couple of guys at work earlier this week. Um, most of the people on my jobs understand that I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I will share the glory of God with people. I will tell people about Jesus Christ. Um, now, I'm not saying I'm perfect and without sin either. I fail God every day, yet he uses me to reach the lost. And don't misunderstand, I can't save anybody, but I can lead them to the one who can. So we can chase after the empty promises, or we can say, you know what? I want to do what God created me to do. I want to agree with you, Lord. I want to take the position he's given to me, whatever it is, wherever it is, and use it for his glory, for his kingdom. You know, so many times we pray that God will line up with our will, right? We, we decide we're going to do a thing and then we ask God to bless it instead of asking God to give us wisdom and guidance and discernment that we might do what he wants us to do, that we might daily take up our cross and follow after him instead of asking him to follow after us. See, a lot of people get it backwards. You know, they'll, they'll start a business and say, oh, God, bless this and line this up and send us customers and give us this and finances and hell, good health and this and that. Instead of saying, Lord, where do you need me? Where do you want me? Here am I, Lord, use me. There is life in the spirit. We need to seek after it. Peter gives us some clues in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn, newborn babes desire that sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious." You want to have some 
lasting change in your Christian walk? Sure you do. This, this change is ours when we discipline ourselves to consume God's Word. Getting the Scripture inside us is very important for this miracle of transformation. So how do you do it? I mean, in this, this verse I just read, Peter tells us to make room for the pure milk of God, the pure milk of the Word of God, by getting rid of the toxic sin in our lives. Peter mentions five specific sins, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Huh. A lot of these things come from the mouth, don't they? Hmm. Peter gives us this list of all this toxic stuff in our lives that needs to go. If you don't get rid of the sin, it's impossible to be a healthy Christian, maturing and growing in the Word. I mean, spiritually, the process of consuming God's Word is just like the process of developing a healthy diet physically. We have to intentionally and purposefully stop consuming junk food in order to consume the things that are good for us. It doesn't do us any good to eat both, right? If you go eat a bunch of junk food for breakfast and lunch and then you have a healthy dinner, you think that's going to offset everything? Reminds me of a thing I heard, uh, what is it, Tim Hawkins, Christian comedian, one time talking about, oh Lord, change this Cheeto into a carrot on the way down, make it healthy. <laughs> Garbage in is garbage out. It's simply impossible to be a healthy, growing Christian if you don't get rid of the sin, if you don't get into the Word. This charge, this change, is within your grasp. God's Word, I think, is one of the best ways to make it happen. So don't waste this incredibly precious gift, the gift of God's Word that He's given us. Let go of the sin and fill yourself with the Word of God. Stop consuming spiritual junk food and instead consume God's Word. Ask Him to lead you, to guide you, to give you wisdom and discernment, to be able to guide His people as you seek to serve Him. And watch what kind of influence your faith might have on others. In 1 Kings, 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. I've been on Mount Carmel where this happened. I've been at the very spot, stood there, just marveling at the image that I conjured up that came from God's Word, seeing it happen in that space. You know, in today's Christian culture, faith is seen as a possession that only affects the owner of it, right? Because of our love for independence and self-sufficiency, in many ways, we've kind of lost the sense of community and outreach that the church is meant to have. We live like 
little islands in our own little personal relationship with Christ, right? But God wants our faith to influence others within and even outside the church. You know, it's not like us for no more shut the door. Here's Elijah's faith. It influenced the entire nation of Israel. His faith. By believing and delivering God's message, he was an example to them all in word and deed. And when he asked the Lord to reveal himself as Almighty God, fire fell from heaven and the people believed. Fire fell from heaven. You know, it's amazing because the Antichrist is going to perform this same kind of miracle and will make others believe. You know, the devil's a liar. And all he can do is maybe imitate God in some ways, in some form. He doesn't have near the power that God has, but he's got a little bit of power. It was amazing to be in that spot and just look around and you could see the the Jezreel Valley, where we know the Battle of Armageddon will take place, and the blood will be up as high as the horse's bridle. It's amazing to go to Israel and have your Bible in hand and read things that happened in the very place where you're standing. I highly recommend it to everybody. Israel should be at the top of your bucket list. Um, this prophet's motive in this showdown at Mount Carmel was to draw the people back to the Lord. If you're not familiar with it, the, the, the one serving the prophet Baal, the, the false god Baal, they were chanting and cutting themselves and doing all sorts of weird things trying to get their god to appear. Elijah poured water on the altar, making it seemingly impossible for fire to take hold there. Then he called upon God and fire fell from heaven, consumed it all. Clearly showing, hey, you know, my God's real. He showed up. Where's your God? Notice he said the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Now Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Um... We usually think of sharing our faith with those who don't know Christ, but our confidence in God can also encourage weak believers or believers who have fallen by the wayside. And in the same way that those who are strong in faith can strengthen us in times of trouble, in times of doubt. The church is described as a body whose parts are all interconnected. Um... Where's that at? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. God never intended that we just live in our own personal faith. You know, we're not like a bag of marbles. We're more like a bunch of grapes whose juices all blend together in times of pressure. We're one. Now Paul says we're all members of the body of Christ, those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but not everyone is a mouth. Not everyone is an eye. You know, some are elbows, some are big toes. <laughs> you know, everyone has a part to play. Everyone has a role that God has created you for. Are you fulfilling all that you can in serving the Lord? Are you doing everything you can to shine the light of Christ? We need to guard against living an isolated Christian life. We need to share our confidence in God's faithfulness. You know, your testimony could help others' faith to grow. If you have doubts or fears, let go of any pride or any shame or any sin and seek help from a stronger believer. You know, mutual blessings come to both when we reach out to one another. When someone comes to me and asks for prayer, I'm blessed also. When I pray with somebody else, it's a blessing to me. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit within me growing stronger and stronger when somebody says, 
hey, I'm having this difficulty. Can you pray with me? Man, immediately, I'm overcome with joy that someone even came to ask me for prayer. I'm always willing to share anything, prayer, ministry, testimony, scripture. The Bible and Bible prophecy are probably my favorite subjects. Sadly, I don't have a lot of friends who share that same. Most of my friends, they're more interested in talking about sports or cars or motorcycles or mountain bikes or hunting or whatever else. <laughs> but thankfully, I'm surrounded by the body of Christ and the body of believers on social media. A lot of people I've never met face to face, but they're my brothers and sisters. We're here to serve people. Don't ever forget that. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.